Um, we now move to uh, our first session of the day uh, with um, three lightning talks. And this is um, the session which we titled Interconnection, Participation and Decision-Making Approaches to Acting Globally. And uh, this session is going to be chaired by uh, Professor Ambrina Manji, who's uh, from the School of uh, Law and Politics and um, in Cardiff University. And uh, so, Ambrina, I'll ask you to uh, join us now. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. And just to um, thank our keynote speaker again for a really fantastic um, start to, to this morning. Um, I, I was really excited to hear um, her reflections on, on cross-disciplinary work and, and, and some of the challenges that I think all of us have, have faced in trying to do that sort of work. Um, and it's clear from listening to, to our speakers this morning, including Professor Fulton, that um, we, we can't address any of the, the critical challenges before us now in relation to climate change and adaptation from the vantage point of any one discipline. Um, but all of us will come to uh, interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary work for different reasons. So for example, in my case, uh, I'm a, a lawyer by training, but I do work well beyond uh, the boundaries of my own discipline, partly out of a sense of dissatisfaction or frustration with, with my discipline and, and, and its perspectives and its limits. Um, and, so there is, a, and I think it's important to emphasize this, there is a, an extent to which some of us come to cross-disciplinary work, um, partly because it's so enjoyable. And it's that enjoyment that I really want to emphasize this morning. I hope that this um, next panel of three fantastic speakers um, will show us the benefits of the, the enjoyment of cross-disciplinary conversations with each other, that, that work of listening really hard to each other across disciplines and trying to hear resonances. So what might it look like when a political scientist, a geographer and a lawyer sit down to talk about climate change and what resonances might they each hear and what might their audiences uh, hear from those presentations? Um, I'd really like to say as well that this morning, um, the three presentations are very much um, an opportunity for you to flag questions that you're finding uh, difficult, that you're thinking through, that you would like your audience to, to think along with you about. So flag those up when you, when you make your presentation, if you'd like to, and say, this is something I'm really puzzled about, trying to work out. Um, you know, are there any thoughts on this? That, that I think is really useful so that there's a sense of, 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 despite being stuck on laptops this morning, there's a sense of community between us. So having made a few introductory comments, um, let's begin with our first speaker this morning. Dr. Amaya uh, Kwere Jazu is a, uh, currently, a Newton International Fellow, a British Academy Newton International Fellow at Aberystwyth University. Um, she is, she has a PhD in political science, and she's going to discuss um, her work on ideas of belonging, which actually follow on beautifully from our keynote this morning. Um, and, and questions of how we understand, make sense of our place in the world. Um, what do these ideas of how we struggle to make sense of, of who we are in the world, our relationship to the world, how might they help us to tackle what is clearly a critical global challenge, which is how we deal with, our, deal with climate uh, change and how we deal with major issues such as, as uh, conflict, which often is related to climate injustice. Um, Dr. Maya, you have the floor for 10 minutes for presentation. Um, and welcome, welcome to, 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 the, uh, to the workshop this morning. 
thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, <clears throat> I am very happy to share some of some aspects of my research uh, during my British Academy Newton International Fellowship at Aberystwyth University, where I have been working with, with Melia. So I will brief, briefly share my screen. My screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so international relations as a discipline is about knowing and producing knowledge about the world. The problem, as Milia has illustrated very much better than I will, is that much of the knowledge produced is based upon important assumptions about reality that, uh, that presume to be universal. One of the most important is the idea of the human as separated from, from nature or superior to, uh, to other species. These assumptions suppress and silence other possible realities and interpretations of what it means to live and with, in and with the world, what it means to belong. Like relational cosmologies, according to which existence is composed of many worlds, a pluriverse of human, animal, spiritual, and spiritual dimensions that are so deeply interconnected that may a whole cosmos. And they all have also different notions of times and space that we don't know, like time can be cyclical, that time can be a spiral, but we assume that time is always linear and the space is always fixed. So if we change drastically by using relational cosmologies, then time is in concept, is not necessarily only linear, but also space is alive. And this shifts uh, dramatically the ways we think about how, what and how and what it means to belong. And so my research uses relationality as an ontological, epistemological and methodolog methodological framework from which to unlearn and disrupt universal assumptions. And that is why my work uh, is also uh, committed to decolonial and postcolonial projects and also to provide of alternative with alternatives. So basically relationality, as Melia has already said, is uh, assumes that reality is primordially consistent or composed of relations, that everything is interconnected. And it is the forces of complementary, the of complementarity of opposites, good, bad, positive, negative, day, night, what generates the dynamics of life. So there are no pre-existing units, things or objects, but if they exist is because the relations have uh, built them. And therefore they are all, always going to be in constant change, becoming and transformation. So they are contingent to relations. So relationality puts reality in terms of traditions, like everything is in constant change. And as Milia said, it, it contradicts the Newtonian or atomistic cosmology when everything is present and we can see things, the world from outside and grasp things and have certainties and, 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 and fix notions and categories. Um, <laughs> so relationality also brings uh, the, uh, these tools of immanence and latency to think of term, in terms of belonging, that things and uh, in, in the pluriverse is there, but you cannot always see that because we are not skilled enough or we don't have the, 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 yeah, the awareness of where and how to find in, in the Western modern uh, practices or, or, or worlds. So basically and briefly, here are some uh, approaches to real relationality. There are many and diverse. Uh, I, I, I have a, a, and I study all of them as, as a source of uh, inspiration, but also of uh, conversing with this literature. I won't uh, have time to uh, explain or go deep into them, but is there's posthumanism, new materialism, physics, and, and the study of cosmologies that come from indigenous cosmologies, relational cosmologies, and postcolonial uh, understanding of what, what is, uh, a cosmology is. So basically this comes from literature, from critical anthropology and critical geography. And there's also the work of deep ecologists that have inspired my work. So basically what I want to talk about here today is that these ideas of belonging to the world that are different from the modern, the human separated, uh, bring important opportunities of disruption and emancipation. Here I mentioned one, uh, uh, Milly already uh, uh, explained what, what implications of the human separated from nature uh, entails. But what I 
want to highlight here is the versus, the human versus nature, which pretty much puts uh, the dynamics of climate change in kind of like a, a war or fighting uh, situation because it's either save and protect or defend and destroy. And this is related to what Haraway and Redekop uh, have called the game is over or the modern blackmail, like putting uh, uh, reality and in terms of either or is very restraining. It becomes a straight jacket of, of how we emancipate uh, uh, that are difficult to emancipate from. So when Haraway says the game is over, pretty much she's referring to the idea that in the capital, capital, capital of Sen, uh, uh, things are put in a way that this is it. Uh, we are facing the sixth uh, extinction and we need to, to uh, take decisions under pressure and nothing good comes when decisions are taken under pressure and in a, in a efficient, uh, efficient uh, logic, as Milia was saying, we need to take more time. And there's also the idea of the black mother, the, the mother black male, sorry, which Redekov re refers to how liberal modern uh, schemes that govern the world, uh, the, 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 um, the dynamics of the world, uh, pretty much say, say it's either democracy, human rights, uh, capitalism, modernization, or is the total chaos out there of, of, uh, of uh, poverty, underdevelopment, conflict, insecurity. So these either or terms pretty much put put us in a very, very uh, stressful and uh, anxiety place. Well, uh, uh, relationality brings like the idea of, okay, both and logic. Well, well you learn to navigate and to, and, and to negotiate with these opposites of uh, conflict, peace, and, and in, in a more creative and, and paced way. Uh, so, as I was saying, relationality is about uncertainty and predictability and the fact that we cannot know it all. So from there, it is better equipped to respond to uncertainty and predictability and incommensurability. So in my work, what I, I, what I do is I, I assume that the pluriverse exists because uh, it but has been covered by these colonial uh, way, uh, processes of, of universalizing the idea of one world world or the universe. So acknowledging that the pluriverse exists but has been silent and is latent is pretty much about developing some skills. And that is why I treat or I emphasize relationality as a methodology to understand the manifestations of the pluriverse. So pretty much this is about of developing skills of awareness to uh, help us understand when the pluriverse is there and, and where we can see it. So although there are many cases and many, there are many methods in relational literatures, here I refer briefly to, to three. The arts of noticing that Singh uh, has elaborated in terms of uh, we need to be more aware of, of what nature is telling us, like see uh, how birds fly when a human approaches or, or uh, what uh, things for us are communicating, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Other work is the work that reconnects from Macy and Brown, deep ecologists who have worked on workshops for like, uh, uh, how to relearn and remember what it means to be connected to nature. There are other relational com commitments, for example, Tim Ingold and Tamara Trouser. But in my, in my research, I have focused on uh, uh, cosmopraxis. Cosmopraxis is an Andean notion that has uh, been developed by anthropologists that pretty much tries to grasp the, this idea of cosmovivencia or cosmoliving that is about the fact that knowing epistemology or being ontology are not separated but are part of the same experience so pretty much refers uh, uh, cos uh, cosmopraxis refers to the fact that we understand reality as we create reality which is a very relational way of seeing how practices are the ones that create uh, reality through relational interactions so um, in that sense, uh, uh, relationality offers many important ways and different ways to rethink global politics in general. Here are some examples, but uh, for more concrete, uh, for more, uh, I, I will refer briefly and concretely to the, 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 the today's theme, which is uh, climate change. 
I believe that relationality ch challenges uh, how climate change is defined as a problem and the solutions that come from our, our rationality that presupposes the separation between human and other species. Relationality offers not only a different uh, lens to understand other associated aspects like natural disasters, pandemics, uh, alimentary crisis, but it also puts straightforward the discussion of human beings as related, part of, connected with other beings incorporating the idea of the other than human as part of the political realm so we all belong together we are all belong we are all part of the same political community <clears throat> however this is very challenging because it because of how deeply rooted anthropocentrism is in in, in our understanding of reality it makes it makes us consider it as impossible specifically because it would imply accepting animals, plants, spirits, or the metaphysical as part of a larger other than human political community and what it means, as Milia was saying, in terms of democracy, decision making, etc. So it sounds weird and it sounds kind of crazy. However, those impossibilities are possibilities that are not only already, already there and exist, but are becoming more salient, even if they if their inclusion of the agenda in the agenda at the international global level has not uh, um, happened because of the disruption that they cause on the existing existent system. Um, <clears throat> indigenous cosmologies, worlds, and ways of living are probably the most obvious example of the existence of the pluriverse within a universe. However, one tends to think uh, that these indigenous cosmologies and worlds are out there in their livelihoods. Uh, so uh, we tend to think of us versus them and the Western versus the non-Western. So in my research, what I have to try is to find the pluriverse entangled and latent in what appear to be Western anthropocentric practices. One example comes via the rights of nature. Uh, the recognition of rivers like the Ganges in Yumana in India, the Atrato in Colombia, the Wanganui in New Zealand, parks, mountains, uh, uh, forests as, as subjects of rights, with rights, or the Universal Declaration of Rights of Mother Earth submitted for ratification to the United Nations in 2011, and the recognition of rights of Earth in Ecuador's constitutions are evident universal manifestations we can learn from. I am now specifically studying the International Tribunals of Rights of Nature, and I was able to attend to COP26 in Glasgow and see the cases uh, uh, lively, uh, the cases on Amazon on, and, the, and climate change. So I, I think that approaching the environment as composed of natural beings, including the human, instead of natural resources object, has a huge uh, impact environmental, uh, in environmental governance. And a deep relational engagement provides with tools particularly methods to reconnect and shift the ways we inhabit the world. We do not dominate, but rather we share with other beings. But I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Amaya, for a really thoughtful presentation. What's um, particularly striking for me is um, how widely you're reading across different literatures and, and, and using them all equally to think about some of these really difficult issues. And, and I think that for me, that's a model of how to do interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary cross work that's, a, that's really important. And I have lots of questions because I work on property, property rights, property law. And what's really a bit interesting for me listening to you is um, the question of what happens when these ontologies clash, but in particular also, how do we, um, how do we, pay attention to the endurance of some of these ways of thinking differently about relations, for example, with land. So how do we account for the fact that ideas of customary rights over land have endured despite massive attacks on them, both nationally and at the level of global policy? Nonetheless, this idea that you don't, we don't own land, we belong to the land, the land owns us, that notion still endures. It seems to be remarkable when I study, you know, for example, indigenous people's property rights, that these ideas have endured and it's that endurance. I'd love to hear more from you on that idea of how, how we account for that and what we might do with that, that fact. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll have questions at the end of our um, three presentations. 
but we'll move on now to our second um, speaker, who is um, Dr. Kerr Smith, who's my colleague at um, Cardiff at the law school here. Uh, her work is on um, ideas of participation and on how um, ideas of participation might affect how individuals and groups advocate for the environment. Um, and she, she uses socio-legal um, methods and her work is based on really outstanding socio-legal empirical research, um, including ethnographic work and, and interviews, um, which she did um, into the inquiry on the M4 corridor around Newport. Um, Dr. Smith's uh, presentation is recorded because she's unable to be with us this morning. So um, just to invite you, Marta, to uh, post Dr. Smith's presentation, which we listen to now. The speakers in this session as the research sounds fascinating. Um, any questions that people have, I'm very happy to respond to by email. On the face of it, you could say that my research project, a public local inquiry into a road scheme in South Wales, is not very global at all. But I would argue it highlights some interesting approaches to acting globally and some challenges to these approaches. I'm going to use my 10 minutes here to identify a few points from my doctoral research that I think are particularly relevant to the theme of this session. Primarily, I'm going to focus on how objectors interrelated global and local environmental contexts in their arguments. And I'll also suggest some ways that the compartmentalizing tendency evident in the inquiry represented a challenge to the strategy. Uh, lastly, I'll note some ways in which public participation was used as a disruptive tool by objectors. So introducing firstly my research. This research project was a socio-legal ethnographic study of the public local inquiry established to consider the M4 corridor around Newport scheme or M4 can inquiry from here on in. This project explored embedded assumptions that shape how legal decision-making processes treat environmental issues to assess whether rationalist assumptions negatively impacted the treatment of the environment at the inquiry. This study consisted of participant observation and conducting semi-structured interviews with inquiry participants and planning stakeholders in Wales. The M4 can was the Welsh Government's proposed scheme to address traffic congestion on the M4 motorway near Newport and it was a major infrastructure project, the proposed route of which went through the more on that later. So firstly, thinking about ways that objectors interrelated the global and local environmental contexts, I'll identify a few ways in which I feel they brought these arguments together. One approach objectors took was to underline the connection between the local environmental problem the scheme represented and the state of the environment globally. Illustrated on the slide, the Gwent Wildlife Trust, closing statement, the Gwent Wildlife Trust being the kind of key environmental objector at the inquiry. Um, this statement underlined the connections between the scheme and the global environmental context, and it further drew on the NRW's, uh, the National Resource Wales State of Nature report for evidence on the troubling state of biodiversity in Wales. Also, objectors gave a kind of space to local knowledge. Public local inquiries are held as a means of bringing local knowledge into broader issues of public policy. And some participants, for example, uh, council, found that compared to the narrow parameters for evidence accepted in a criminal case, the inquiry considered an impressive range of views and forms of knowledge, from the person whose back garden is being destroyed to scientists and global impacts. However, despite this diversity of views that were heard in the room, this council acknowledged that layperson testimony, from a legal point of view, has very minimal import. In his opinion, it did not seem to have an impact on the inspectors. And environmental objectors feared that the undervaluing of local knowledge had a negative impact on the environment. The Gwent Wildlife Trust Reserves Officer, in an interview after the inquiry, noted that he identified several errors in the Welsh Government's evidence. Errors made by the Welsh Government were, for the Reserves Officer, directly related to a lack of local knowledge. Equally, his ability to identify these errors derived from his strong local knowledge. He noted, which you can read on the slide, they were saying aquatic invertebrates would not be lost in this field. Well, it's obvious they wouldn't be lost in this field because they're an aquatic invertebrate. So that highlights some of the holes in most government's barristers' knowledge of the area and the wildlife in the area. They're obviously expert in what they do. They just don't have a knowledge of the area or the wildlife. To them, it's probably just a Latin name in a document, I suspect. To a lot of people, it's a Latin name in a document, isn't it? For the reserves officer, 
This lack of in-depth knowledge suggests a disconnect between inquiry and the affected land. The comment to a lot of people, it's a Latin name in a document, suggests that for the reserves officer, these species are not merely Latin names, it suggests an emotional attachment to the affected environment, and suggests that embedded within situated knowledge is an emotional collection, connection to the local environment. And this brings us to the last point in this section. The objectors sought to make space for this emotional attachment to local environment in the inquiry. We return again to the Gwentwell Lecture's closing statement. Again, the quote is on the slide here. So this extract from the closing statement captures the unique nature of the Gwent levels and the approach taken by the Gwent Wildlife Trust. When there is no recognition of attachment to nature or to place, this can adversely impact the treatment of the environment, I would argue. By recognising people's love of nature and making space for people to talk about their love of nature, the idea that nature has some form of intrinsic value is in some ways acknowledged. So what are some of the challenges to this approach then? Well, in the months following the close of the inquiry, I spoke with several participants about their experience of the inquiry. And two environmental objectors, I quoted again here on the slide, shared their frustrations with the inquiry process. I'll give you a second to read those there. So, I would say these comments demonstrate the impact that the compartmentalizing tendency of the inquiry had in the treatment of environmental impacts. In particular, the effects on kind of these interconnections and the impact the the ways of highlighting these interconnections between local and global impacts. The first objector describes a form of epistemic compartmentalization, where issues were treated in isolation to the extent that individual problems were treated separately and detached from their impacts. The second objector describes a form of legal compartmentalization, where the scheme's potential impacts were detached from future cases and from the broader environmental context. The importance of designing holistic responses to environmental challenges was repeatedly raised at the inquiry. However, environmental issues tended to be addressed individually. This potentially had the consequence of making them look less significant. Interview participants noted that objections were tied to specific issues that the Welsh Government would then seek to address. Inherent in this approach was the assumption that all environmental issues could be individually identified and addressed. This reflects a concern raised by Jason about the compartmentalising approaches to environmental issues prevalent in risk-based regulation. She contends that they can minimise issues and make them seem manageable, noting that it's harder to ask radical questions about underlying philosophies of development, consumption or resource use within this framing. The second objector argued that the scheme's broader environmental impacts were not captured when they were detached from their wider context. It was challenging for objectors to raise these concerns within the inquiry process. It was also challenging for them to make a case for the intrinsic value of the environment. The environmental objector's reactive role was determined by the scale of the scheme and the short time frame of the inquiry process, which meant they were kind of forced to focus only on aspects of the scheme where they could respond with sufficient expertise, kind of further narrowing down their approaches. This underlines that opportunities to consider the scheme's wider environmental impacts were limited. So how effective were these attempts to bring local knowledge and local attachment into the planning inquiry to situate a local scheme in its global environmental context? Looking at the inquiry process narrowly, you might say that they were ineffective. The inspector recommended that the scheme go ahead. However, First Minister Mark Drakeford did not approve the scheme stating in his decision letter that even were it not for the scheme's funding issues, he would have decided against it on the grounds of the unacceptable environmental impact on the Gwent levels. While the inspectors and their report did not seem to find the unique approach to the environmental objectors especially persuasive, we should consider the inquiry in its broader context to assess the impact of their approach. Several participants argued that public participation in the inquiry had to be viewed in the light of this wider public involvement. Those involved with the Gwent Wildlife Team, Gwent Wildlife Trust Team, described a two-track strategy, advocating with assembly members as well as submitting evidence to the inquiry. And while 
the inquiry is a mechanism for public participation in the planning system, the structures in which it operates meant that ultimately it was less responsive to public voice in the assembly, the mechanism of representative governance. It's important to know that this isn't a case of one strategy succeeding and one failing. It was the two strategies working in combination together that were in this instance effective. An inquiry is a mechanism of public participation. It's a piece of machinery that has a set of functions, some intended by its developers and some not. The N4 can inquiry was used as a means of public participation in ways that those who called it didn't really intend. Arguments made in the public inquiry were, re re were reiterated in talks with assembly members and in the media. Moreover, as noted by the Gwent Wildlife Trust Council, if there wasn't an inquiry process, the road would have been built years ago. Calling inquiry acknowledges the right of the public to be heard on an issue that affects their locality. It initiates a typically very slow moving process that gives, that gives you time to build the voice against the people who've got the money, who drive these changes, who usually arrive very well prepared and ready to deal serves as a beacon for argument and for protest and provided an opportunity for a broader range of values to be heard and acknowledged. This has been a very brief overview of some aspects of my research that have relevance to the themes of the session, I think. And I hope you found it interesting or thought provoking. I look forward to hearing from some of your presentations later. Diolch and Gura Mahagat, thanks very much. Gaurav Margaret, uh, Claire, that was uh, a really fantastic uh, presentation for, for those of us who are particularly emotionally attached to the Gwent levels. It's a really beautiful um, place. It was very thought provoking to hear you um, talk about the, the limits of, of a planning inquiry, the limits about that kind of quasi judicial uh, process in trying to take on board and translate and understand and in, in um, in a legal forum, uh, these uh, epistemic claims, which which generally um, pose such a challenge to, to to lawyers and to to the discipline of of law, um, I hope that if you have questions for Kerry, you will um, perhaps put them in the chat box, colleagues, and we can pass them on to her. I'm sure she'll also listen to this to the recording of this uh, workshop. Um, later, so do do make sure that you feed any questions through to her. We'll move now on to our uh, third uh, speaker. Our third speaker this morning is Dr. Feng Mao. Dr. Mao is a lecturer uh, in environmental and physical geography at Cardiff. Her interests are um, in the idea of really novel and for me really innovative idea um, of, of serious uh, games. Um, so the idea of games that go beyond entertainment, um, but that might provide us with insights into um, how we might deal with and adapt to future uh, crises, including climate change. So this uh, presentation is based on an impact project, importantly, um, in which a group of international uh, researchers, practitioners, users come together to co-explore uh, the possibilities for using this idea to, um, to think about climate change and adaptation. I'm particularly curious to hear uh, what, what um, serious games are and how they might be uh, utilized in this context. It seems to me highly innovative and particularly interesting that this is a project that comes, that is presented as, comes out of an impact project. So uh, welcome Dr. Mao, you have 10 minutes and the floor is yours. All right, um, let me share my screen first. Okay, so would you be able to see my screen? Yes, okay, good, good. Right, let's start. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have the chance to give a lightning talk in this early career research conference today. So my name is Feng Mao, 
and I am a lecturer in environmental and physical geography from Cardiff University. And my research, the research interests lie in the intersection of water ecosystem, society and technologies with a, a focus on water security. So in the next few minutes, I will introduce a recently launched impact project, um, Game Engage. So the, the, uh, the project team has two other members, as we can see on the screen, um, Katie, a computer scientist, and, and Shasta, uh, an earth scientist, both, both from um, Cardiff University. So in this project, we will build an international network of serious game researchers, practitioners, and users to co-develop uh, co new opportunities in serious games for climate change adaptation. And then we are, um, in, in this presentation, I will also invite you to join our uh, network to play and discuss serious games together. Well, first of all, what is serious games? So it has a very simple definition. A serious game is a game designed for purposes beyond pure entertainment. It is a game, so it must be fun, but it also has a serious reason to play it. Serious games are useful tools for supporting environmental governance and resilience building under climate change. And serious games for this purpose um, usually are built upon systems analysis and simulation approaches. So sometimes they are also referred as social simulations. These games usually have a feedback mechanism to represent the complex interactions in real world situations and players act as certain roles in the game to play or make decisions in simulated scenarios. And after each gameplay, there is often a debriefing stage so that players can share and discuss the game experience. So this stage is extremely helpful, actually, in supporting learning by, by playing. And however, these elements may vary across games. And there is a, a very wide variety of serious game types. It can be a board game or a card game. It can also be a digital game that runs on a PC or a mobile phone. So it can be a single player game or require more than one player. And the gameplay can be very short, less than 10 minutes, for example, or last for more than two hours. The serious games are a very useful method for uh, many serious reasons. Um, for example, it is um, an effective teaching tool um, to communicate complex concepts such as systems dynamics, climate risk management, and environmental governance. And it is a tool uh, to learn implicit knowledge and to train soft skills such as nego negotiation and problem solving. Serious games can support uh, research and also um, policy making by simulating um, social interactions in given scenarios. And serious games have been used to build um, the capacity within communities for better environmental governance. And they are also regarded as a promising way to encourage public and uh, stakeholder engagement in adaptation planning and actions. Um, last but not the least, Serious games offer an inno innovative opportunity to, to co-create new solutions to cope with or even induce transformative change for the uncertain future. So um, if you are interested in exploring some examples of serious games, uh, I recommend two databases. So the first one, this is a website called Games for Sustainability, and you are able to view more than 100 games or serious games in different categories. So the games are also classified into SDG groups um, so that you can very easily um, find those specific games. And the second one, the second one is a, a game library provided by Climate Center. Almost all the games in this library require a physical play space and multiple players. And um, they are not digital games, but det detailed game rules or play rules for each game are provided online. So on this slide, I will uh, I'll briefly talk about a serious game that we used before. So the game is called Forest at Risk. It was developed by one of our project partners. And this game is about forest and risk management. 
a forest community faces recurrent but uncertain earthquake and flood hazards that may damage not only household assets, but also forest ecosystems and infrastructure. So players act as villagers in these forest community. And it is a challenge for the, uh, uh, the players to, to, to manage the conflicts between, on one hand, their personal interest, and on the other hand, the community's common interest. So they need to work out collective, collective actions to manage, one, the forest, which they cut for income. And the second, um, the disaster protection infrastructure, which they need to uh, collectively invest to build. And the game is pl played in 10 rounds. And in each round, each player individually uh, makes a list of uh, decisions, such as how many trees to cut for income, how, how much money to invest for communities disaster protection infrastructure, and how, how much to spend on uh, forest monitoring, or even sectioning selfish and greedy villagers who cut too many trees. And uh, we can, uh, they can see the change um, of uh, the forest their community and also their income at the end of each round and they can also initiate two or three community meetings during the whole gameplay well um a few dozens of sessions have been organized across the world already so the photo for example on the left on the left is a discussion with villagers in sichuan china when the game was uh, being developed in 2013 and the photo on the right this one uh, is actually a section uh, a, a session uh, organized last month in, in zhejiang university so we can see very interesting results if we put these sections as uh, uh, these sessions together um, for example, um, if we look at these figure, um, these figure shows the changes of forest over uh, the 10 rounds. So the X axis is the round from round one to round 10, and the Y axis is the percentage of the forest coverage from one to 100%. And the lines um, re represent the forest change in different sessions. So in some sessions, the forest uh, was sustainably managed at, uh, at, at a high level throughout the place. And in some other uh, um, sessions, the forest collapsed um, very quickly after the second or the third round. And very interestingly, some sessions performed a resilient behavior and the damaged um, um, uh, forest recovered gradually after a few rounds. So for researchers, so if we study the players' choices and their interactions, um, we will be able to better understand how resilience can be built. And for uh, participants, according to the feedback from players, um, this game helped them learn difficult ideas such as systems thinking and the concepts such as um, um, tragedy of commons and helped them understand how important trust is in um, environmental governance and how hard it can be built. Now, let me talk about our project, Game Engage. Um, well, it is a Cardiff University's um, innovation for all impact Kickstarter projects. And in this project, we aim to co-develop uh, opportunities of serious games for climate change adaptation by developing a new um, international uh, network of serious game researchers, practitioners, and, and users. So the, the, the project has three main objectives. Firstly, we would like to develop uh, the network about serious games. And we'll then organize meetings, uh, workshops, or even gameplay sessions to uh, co-develop opportunities of serious game for climate change adaptation in the post-COVID era. And finally, we are planning to uh, develop a toolbox to help people enter the field of serious games or even develop one themselves. So we plan to organize an online serious game conference next year and invite partners and participants to share their perspectives, experience, or, or research on using serious games for climate change adaptation. So we now have partners and participants from a few organizations across the world. Besides within Cardiff University, we have partners from a panda conservation NGO, uh, researchers and, uh, and teachers from, from Austria, China, and Singapore. And here, 
we invite you to join our network to play and discuss serious games together. So you don't have to be an expert to play the game, and you can think about how to incorporate um, this idea into your own teaching or even research. And we also welcome people who have passion on a serious game development um, to, to talk to us. Lastly, um, if you are interested in joining this network or want to participate in our future events or would like to receive um, our project updates, please scan this QR code on the screen and it will take you to the expression of interest form and all um, you can visit the link if you prefer and you are encouraged to, to share this link or even this page with your colleagues who might be interested in um, this idea of uh, serious games. I also put uh, our email addresses on the right, so please feel free to contact us after uh, this uh, 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 conference and if you have any, any further uh, questions. And well, um, that, that is all for my lightning talk and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Ma. That was a really fascinating presentation um, about, a, I think, a, a relatively new project. But I see already from the chat that there are um, colleagues wishing to, to sign up and to participate. So that's fantastic. Um, for me, that was um, really thought provoking from the perspective of, of um, law and particularly of law teaching, uh, because there's huge, it seems to be potential there for thinking about, for example, future law reform. And I love this contradictory title almost, this kind of idea of serious games. Um, just in that phrase, there's so much potential for, um, I, for example, pedagogic work about, you know, how do we game uh, seriously, so how do we think about the future and how do we think about, for example, future proposals for law reform in, in the sorts of ways that you've been suggesting? I, I think it's really resonated with, um, with the audience here this morning. I see that from, from the chat box. So um, let me just check if there are questions for you. I've, I've also said, please, colleagues, do put up your hands if you um, have a question that you want to ask and I'll try and spot you. But I think that there is a question here. Is there from Siobhan, am I right? Um, are these games for young adults, Dr. Mao? Um, and, um, or for older, um, older people? And if so, how do you help to support them through um, growing anxiety and despair? I'm sorry, my box is, is not allowing me to read that completely correctly, but I hope that's given you the gist of, of what what's being asked. And if you want to answer that, you're very welcome to do so now. Yep. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for for your question. And uh, um, I I think um, serious game is a, a concept or an idea that um, to um, to use it usually we have to have the actual game or have the application. And the, the game or the application can be uh, tailorly design, designed for a target communities. It, it can include uh, young adults or be used for uh, older uh, kind of adults. So um, for example. Um, it, uh, when we are using it for, um, in, in education, um, it ca I, I think can be used uh, for uh, high school students to understand the, the, the very complex ideas like climate change or how people should uh, trust each other or build collaborations in um, climate adaptation. So the, will, these kind of thing will be very, very difficult to, to, to learn by just reading textbooks. And uh, for, for the adults, we, we had some, some kind of experience or uh, observations that these kind of activities can be actually designed uh, into, uh, into projects um, as a way to, to encourage public engagement. So if we would like to talk to, to um, local people uh, or uh, community people, um, so we, we, we must have some kind of activities. So we can have, a, for example, focus groups or, or interviews or talk to them, um, but we can also organize uh, activities like, like, like these. Uh, one ex a story, a very quick story I can share was that a, a, a gameplay organized in China. So um, they, they do uh, forest conservation and usually uh, the villagers and the offic of officers, they don't um, really understand 
each other. Uh, what they are doing in, in something sometimes, but um, in one game, um, the uh, we ask the, the the officers to play as the villagers, and the villagers play as the the officers. So after uh, the the game play, well, they 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 realize that so the, why um, the other side of the people they they behave like that or they make decision um, um, in, in, in that way. So I, I hope um, it un, un, answered your, your question. Thanks, Dr. Ma. There's a, a kind of follow up from Siobhan, which is really how do you intend to raise awareness of, of, of the potential of these games outside of communities who are already um, thinking about these issues? So it's really just about a little bit maybe more about um, the, the kind of public engagement aspect of that work that you're doing. Um, on on impact. So you, you, I think, have already shared the the link with us. But are there other plans that you have for bringing on board people who might not otherwise know this 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 work? Mm -hmm. um, Yes, yeah, so um, I, I think that the uh, serious game uh, is a kind of a, a, a relatively new concept, um, but it has its, a, 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 its, its own community. So uh, I, I think um, the, the project itself is an impact project. So uh, the nature of the activity uh, for, for us would be uh, try to, to encourage people to think about it and to, to promote the ideas and to also to organize, uh, organize sessions. So and, uh, the, our community or network will be quite open so uh, we will welcome people to to talk to us and, and join our uh, future activities thank you very much indeed um i i have a, a question which I'd, I'd like to return to um for for maya which is um my about that um question of resilience that i i um, mentioned when when you finished your presentation and about how you um might understand the continuation of, of these kind of insurgent ways of thinking, for example, about property that's, that continue to, 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 to exist, to have a hold, and, and what how we understand the clash. So for example, in relation to property rights, how we understand the clash between state attempts and global attempts to, um, to promote private property, titling and registration of land, and still the attachment that people have to much broader ideas and ontological claims to land which are about stewardship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think one of the, the main functions of uh, serious games would be it creates a kind of a virtual or simulated environment or, or scenarios that uh, people can uh, very difficult to experience. Perhaps they, they, they don't have a chance to experience it or uh, the scenario will be in the future and we, we design it and it's a kind of imagined one. So um, by doing these kind of activities, it helps us actually to understand that they they haven't experienced or it, it hasn't happened uh, happened yet. So um, I, I I don't know whether this uh, kind of answer would uh, would kind of answer your 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 question. Thank you, um, Dr. Mao. Uh, Amaya, did you have uh, uh, any reflections on that question? Yes, thank you very much for the question. The idea of properties kind of uh, complex when it comes to uh, clashing ontologies or worlds, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. pretty much uh, uh, it's how the world is working, like the, the idea of private property and privatizing the world. It's, uh, it's complicated for uh, indigenous communities who don't have the, uh, the idea or the notion of something being private or, or being owned by, uh, especially by an individual. And in com when it, I'm sure you know this better than me, that what they are doing is like trying to have these property rights co as collective rights. And they are working on um, to protect their designs, their knowledges and, and their ways of living uh, as property rights, because that is the, the only, possibly the only way that they have to protect their livelihoods uh, nowadays where the system is thing, thought 
as in terms of property. But it, when it comes to the property of land, the, the, the thing is still much more complicated because it's either they have access to land as recognized as uh, uh, indigenous community, communities where the, pro the property is like a common to the community, but still is like a, a way of thinking of property as of a commodity, an object, land is an object. And for example, in the, in the, in the first, uh, um, peace agreement uh, uh, draft in Colombia, this was very problematic mm -hmm. for indigenous communities because mm -hmm. it was a liberal uh, way of thinking uh, the post-conflict uh, that thought of, okay, let's give land back to the indigenous, the land that, the land ha that has been, uh, they have been dispossessed. So the, uh, the problem is solved by, by giving them the land back. But the problem is, was not that for them. The problem was that uh, just getting the land back was not uh, was not recovering what was lost. What was lost that the land was sick, the the, the land was uh, had an, an illness, and to be allowed to uh, uh, settle again in the lands that they had dispossessed required a more deep reflection on what how to heal the land to be a home again. Uh, so that's one case, and the and, and the when you said uh, or asked about what happens when these ontologies clash, uh, well, pretty much um, what happens is that uh, this the system has these languages that uh, okay, this is solved, this is uh, this is already covered and solved by multicultural approaches or by okay uh, equality in indigenous participation and things like that, but they don't really include different worlds. They assume okay you, they they assimilate the world so okay you if you want to be part of the global community you have to accept these rules of the games so pretty much people don't live in their own terms they have negotiated and included in what has been called the ontological captures uh, so these ontological clashes, however, and, and that is why I'm investigating and I use the, the tribunals of rights of nature to investigate this more is where is where the politics starts. How do we negotiate to live in similar terms to, to worlds that are not necessarily, uh, one cannot absorb the other because that's not the idea, but how to, do we negotiate this coexistence? So in the tribunals, I have seen that there are minimal terms of agreement okay, the language of rights is Western and it's problematic. The problem of representation is anthropocentric. And there are all these problems that are there, but somehow there are the minimal agreements of many, many varied and diverse groups of people that converge there and negotiate the difference. So that is more than the, the, the rights or the rule of law that they want to build, what, what uh, calls my, my attention is how they negotiate the differences to uh, to move on and, and, and shift the, the glo global challenges uh, from relational perspectives. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you yeah. very much, Amaya. Really thought provoking for me. I'm doing work on land restitution at the moment. So those reflections, I think, are really, really um, helpful. And, and all three speakers have have, I think, raised this theme of participation and fora and how different languages work across different fora really, really very effectively this morning. I found this exceptionally productive personally, but also I'm, I'm thrilled to see uh, a workshop of this, of this sort bring us all together. Thank you very much to the Learned Society of Wales.